coming. In this talk, uh, that I call semantic site building. This is actually a talk that I first made about in 2012, actually. I decided to, to bring it back and update it for Drupal 8. It's still very relevant. So where I'm coming from with this with this idea of semantic site building is I really find that the biggest problem in a lot of the Drupal sites that I see is the way that they are, the way that the content model is architected and the way things are made, it just didn't, people didn't put enough thought into how they name things and how they were consistent with the way things were named. It makes things very difficult to use and kind of ruins a lot of Drupal sites. So I really think that people need to put a little bit more thought into how they're working with Drupal on the site building level in order to make a good CMS. So my name is Jody Hamilton. I am the CTO and co-founder of Ziv Tech, which is in Philadelphia. We're basically a, mainly a Drupal uh, shop down there. We started the company 11 years ago. I do a lot of different things there, um, primarily web strategy, like uh, planning projects. I also do a lot of auditing of problem projects that come my way to help rescue them. I do um, Drupal development trainings, and I do a fair amount of Drupal development and development in other frameworks as well. I just really enjoy development. And my name is, on Drupal.org is Jody Lin, and on Twitter, Jody Kent. And will you be sharing your slides? Sure, I'll put them on the, uh, on the page on the, on the site. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. So, I'm, this, these slides are going to be have a lot of definitions on them for you to enjoy. I got a lot of the definitions out of Drupal.org slash glossary. There, there's this glossary page on Drupal.org that explains what a lot of Drupalisms mean. Maybe, I don't think it includes the word Drupalism. That one's kind of self-explanatory. So you hear a lot about like the semantic web and semantic URLs and semantic markup. So I wanted to extend that to kind of the art and science of Drupal site building. And so that it's a, it's a way of kind of giving more thought to what you're doing by, by looking at naming. So, so I'm going to be talking about two different main sections in this talk. The first part is going to be how to name things so that they go well with the build. And the second part will be how to build things so they go well with the names. Right? So because we have, we are, when we're working in this framework, we have to do a lot of naming, but we also have to work with, with parts of the stack that are already named. So we have to kind of think about things on both levels. And this, <laughs> this is Drew Clippy. Back in 2012 when I first did this talk, uh, one of my employees, uh, who's actually here today, Megan, not here, here, but I mean, uh, made me this Drew Clippy, and he's like Drupal Clippy. So he's just there for side commentary. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about how to name things. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, computer science, you know, naming is one of those really hard problems. I don't know if it's that really that hard of a problem. It does take some thought. Uh, I'm gonna give you um, some ways to to frame how you need to think about naming and, and make sure that you take naming seriously. Don't just shrug your shoulders and just name things whatever. Because when things are named poorly, that confusion just continues for the entire life of the project. So to understand what I'm kind of talking about here, what do we name as Drupal site builders and developers? Lots of Right? A lot of times it falls to Drupal site builders to 
to come up with the names of all of these different things. We're naming content types, we're naming fields, we're naming image styles and roles, formats, regions, all of this naming that we're doing. And we don't necessarily see ourselves as the people who should be doing that and may sometimes kind of shrug it off like it's not important, but it is important and it's on us because nobody else is really, you know, there's, there's not like someone else in the project who understands all of this who's going to be doing this all for us, right? So if we don't take the time and thought to name these things well, nothing is really ever going to make sense in the CMSs that we're building. So I'm going to go through um, in the second part some of these specific things and some of the gotchas and some tips on naming certain ones. But for the beginning, I'm going to kind of talk about some of the philosophy of how to name things well and what to think about to, to do a good job. So the first thing to think about in naming is consistency. Everything kind of lives and dies by consistency. So some simple ways to think about consistency, singular or plurals. When you're making a content type, do you call it um, events or event, right? So there's usually like a standard and you, can, and you can follow it. So in the case of content types, it's a singular, right? And it's usually capitalized. Um, same thing with like a database table in Drupal. It's usually singular. So you want to watch out for case you know, whether things are capitalized or not, it just makes the system, if, you, if you're sloppy on these little things, it, it tells the people that are using the system that you're probably sloppy about a lot of things, right? And I'm not like a neat freak or anything like that, um, but I just see the architecture content model of these sites is like surgery. It's a time to be clean. It's not like a time to be messy because this is going to affect everything, right? Spelling, obviously, get your spelling right, and be consistent. Obviously, there's some words in the English language that have various spellings. So be consistent with how you spell them. Um, be consistent with your use of punctuation. If you're writing help text, is it going to be a full sentence that ends with a period, or is it not? Like It should be consistent. If you're going to use abbreviations, be consistent with that. Redundancy is never useful. We're making complex systems here, so you shouldn't be adding in information that's redundant. So here's an example. This person created a news content type, and they tried to do a good job by putting some description for what it was, but their description was a content type for adding news. If you don't have any you know, additional information to share, don't share anything at all, right? Um, so it just gets in everyone's way because you had to read something that was redundant. Some other examples, naming your theme, Acme theme. What if you made a, a link field and you named it link field? Uh, related content view view, right? So don't include the name of the thing that you're naming. You know, my name is a Jody person. It's kind of implied, right, that I'm a person. Okay, so extensibility is important in all things Drupal because we're all about being this extensible system. So when we're naming things, we need to think about, is this a thing that is likely to grow? Like, am I just kind of starting a bucket where I'm, I'm going to add more things? Or is it fully defined the way it is now? Sometimes, what you're, especially if you're making a module, for example, it's more of a bucket. So here's a sort of anti-pattern example. This person's module name is custom staff page filters. So this is a custom module that provides a single function on, in a single place, right? That was relevant to them when they were making the module. But it's not going to be relevant the next time they have to add something else, right? They're going to have to, they're going to end up with 10,000 modules if they go this way, right? So instead, they could have just named the module staff. Then any time they have any functionality related to the staff section of their site, they can add it there. So you kind of have to think ahead to where things, how things might grow, right? You don't 
like design a house for you know the the kitchen items that you have right now when you're just you know starting your life you think about well I'm probably going to get a dishwasher so I might need a place to put it so make it a little bit bigger right malleability means that you can give things a name that take into account that their use might change, right? So a good example of that is an image style. A lot of times you'll see a site where the name of the image style is thumbnail 100 by 100. Then when you go to add the thumbnail, you're like, why is it 150 by 120, right? Because they changed it, but the name didn't change. That's not good. That's just going to confuse everyone forever. So one trick with that is, for a lot of things in Drupal, including image styles, there are machine names, and then there are human names. So be careful with the machine name that it's more malleable. But the human name can be more specific because it's easy, easily changed. So your human name could be thumbnail 100 by 100. You could change that later. But just make your machine name thumbnail because that's hard to change. But Jody, sometimes you run across when you have the small, the large, the extra large, then you have to come up with a super tiny or something, or... Yes, that's, that's true too. So it starts being... So, think that. so that's not really, so like, you know, small, you know, this kind of like relative names can be problematic, right? So yeah. I prefer to, to name an image style more on where it's used on the site, like if it's... Because a lot of times they're very specific, so it'll be like a banner, right? Instead of like large, or it'll be full width, or half width, right? Um, okay, so usability is sort of the why this stuff matters, right? So if you're not naming things well, your site is not going to be very usable, especially for the editors. This happens on the front ends of sites as well. But it's something that people in general in, in our industry put more thought into the front ends of sites. And that's where, that's where a lot of like usability and design work happens. And um, a lot of times, the sort of usability of the CMS falls onto the developers and the site builders who aren't even necessarily realizing that they're in the usability business, right? But really, we're making software for people. <coughs> usability is always the number one thing that matters. Maintainability is, I would call, sort of the usability for developers, right? So, so if things are named poorly and, and organized poorly in the code and in the um, deployment processes and everything like that, now you have bad maintainability, which is also going to cost you a lot of money because it makes everything slower. It's hard to ramp people onto the project because they have to learn all these specific things all, like, before they can really understand it. If things are named in an intuitive fashion and organized intuitively, people can just jump right onto the project and it makes sense and they can be successful with it and not make mistakes. Okay, so the next section it's going to talk more about thinking about the names that we already have in the Drupal system. And thinking about what they mean and how we should respect them to make the system more intuitive. So for example, if um, like don't make something a, a taxonomy term if it's not being used for categorization, right? So make things make the function of what you're building match the name and uh, the definition of the tools that you're using so that everyone else that uses the site will be able to understand what it is you're doing. So start kind of at the most basic in terms of Drupalisms, the content type. So a content type, obviously, is a type of content. The second definition is um, getting a little bit more Drupal technical. A content type is a bundle of the node entity. And the third definition is that it's a, a set of fields and other settings appropriate to a set of site content. Okay, so, so that's very specific. And 
and it kind of tells you what it is and what it isn't. And it also kind of exposes a problem we've had for a long time in Drupal, which is the connection between the word content and node. We have two words for the same thing. We try to keep node to developers, and then we try to put content in front of editors and users, but doesn't really, we don't really do it very cleanly. We're kind of we're kind of stuck with this word node that means content. So if you think about what a content type is, I've really come to see it as more like a page. It's really more like a page. So you can see the content sometimes uh, in other ways. Like it's, if it's a news post, you'll see like a teaser of it on the news on the news landing page. But I like to think of them as primarily pages because I think that's how the editors understand them. So I like to think if something is a page on the site, it should be a piece of content. If it's a section of the page only, there is no full page version, it shouldn't be. And that just about everything um, that is a page should be content. Because I don't want my editors going to some front end page on their site and they can't figure out how to edit it because every other page says view and edit, but this one doesn't. And then I have to tell them, oh, that's because I built that one with views, or I built that one in a module. So you can't add the same things that you add. You can't configure it the same way as everything else. Let them configure every page the same way. The other benefit of that is going to be that every page will be in their search results. So let me show you some examples. Okay, so here is a like a news landing page. This is I'm going to show you examples of mostly sites that I've uh, worked on the past year that are Drupal 8 sites. So this is a, a news landing page, and it's a faceted search using Search API, and it lists the latest news, and you can you know facet it here, and then they can add some you know calls to action over here. So I don't tell them, oh, they have to go to views and go configure, like say they wanted to change this image. I don't say, oh yeah, on that page, oh, I'm glad you made a ticket about this because you couldn't do it. Uh, now a developer has to tell you that on that page we built it with views, so you have to like go configure uh, some block somewhere, or you have to go configure a views header in this really confusing interface that really isn't for you at all. No. The whole thing is a page, just like every other page. So they hit edit here, they can change their header image, and then here's the contents of the page. This is all using paragraphs. They can pick their color scheme, they, and then here they can include, or I can include for them, but they can still understand how this is built. Here's the list of searchable articles, which is actually built with views put in there, and then they, and here's the, um, the facet form, and then they can add other things. They can add their house ads, they can add their media contact, they can edit that. They don't have to go somewhere else to try to understand what's on that page, because it's all content. And then when I build, this is another site, built the same, a similar way. Here, what if somebody comes to search, and they search for news? Well, if it was a view, they would find everything except for the news landing page, right? They would find all the individual news, but they would never find the news page. Since news is a page, now they, they search for it and you find news. You come to the news page, right? So, so to me, it's just about anything on the, on the front end that doesn't begin with admin, uh, should be a, should be some sort of content, and then it'll show up in search. They can put their meta tags on it, and it'll be like a normal page. They can handle everything the same way. Get back to here. Okay, so so a lot of times you, you'll see on sites 
these content types with these with kind of sometimes with strange names. A lot really common one for a content type, carousel slide. You're like, carousel slide. Well, it doesn't really fit in. You've got like news post, you've got um, event, you've got landing page, and then you've got carousel slide. But that's just like one little part of a carousel that shows up on your home page. So it doesn't really match the other ones there, right? Um, so it just kind of makes everything a little bit weird. And then they have to do all kinds of things so that they have to configure this, that, and the other thing so that carousel slides don't show up in the search results. And then they have to worry about, oh, I don't want people directly seeing the carousel slide pages. So there's this module called rabbit hole that people use. Has anybody ever used this? Rabbit hole? Yeah. It's, I don't like it because the name tells you nothing. And so every single time you see, oh, here's the rabbit hole settings, your mind has to do this extra step where you go, what's a rabbit hole? Well, it's some module that people configure so that you can't actually directly view a, a piece of content and it redirects you somewhere else. But you're like, hey, if you don't want them to directly view a piece of content, maybe it's not a piece of content, right? It's a kind of like a weirdly named thing that people are using to fix another problem with naming. So it's sort of like a tool that bad namers use because they don't, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't think like this is a terribly named thing that I should never use. So they're not, they don't think like this. Um, okay, so I'm going to say Node is sort of a problematic word for us in Drupal because we always have to start out like Drupal 101, when we bring a new person to Drupal, we have to say, just so you know, a node is a piece of content. The fact that we have to tell them that is not a great thing, right? Like, like if you, it's like a, it's like a joke. If you have to explain it, it it's not a good, it's not good, right? So, um, so we are endlessly trying to explain it because we're stuck with this word node. But on the other hand, it's an interesting, it's an interesting word to think about its, what its definition is. So our sort of Drupal definition is that it's a piece of content, or an instance of a content type bundle, right? That's the more like developer way of thinking about it. But a more general definition is a node is a point at which lines or pathways intersect or branch, a central or connecting point. So in this word is sort of like a clue about what really makes Drupal great. It's all about having our content structured in such an intelligent way that we can make content intersect and connect with other kinds of data. And that's always what we've done best in Drupal. And it's always going and it's the thing that kind of keeps us like having something different than, than these sort of like, you know, flat file systems or any of these other solutions, is that we have these all these great systems where we can connect content with other content, we can connect it with the author that made it, we can have ways of featuring the content that connects it in these custom lists, we can flag the content, we can combine it in groups and have different access control for it. We have all of these amazing ways to connect data and that's kind of like what the node like reminds us of is how important those connections are and how you can use it to build these dynamic sites with all kinds of relationships between content. Thank you. It's almost like he's getting these ideas from me. Um, okay, so if you, if you were kind of confused when I said you know, certain things really don't need to be content, then welcome to the world of entities. So, um, in sort of Drupal, I've been, I've been involved with Drupal for a long time, and there used to, we didn't used to have this concept of entities, and because of that, everything had to be a node. So we had all kinds of strange systems going on. We would say, we had, we would try to combine nodes with other things in Drupal. We would have something called content profile, where you could have a node one node for every user on your site where they, so they could fill in fields on their profile. We would have, we had um, modules that were like 
block node and node block and menu node and uh, just any combination you could possibly have with node you have. And then a wonderful thing happened with the uh, with Drupal core where a huge effort was made to, to abstract the idea of these fieldable entities so that it wouldn't just be about nodes and it could become this, this greater thing that could be used for users and taxonomy terms and files and all kinds of other things that needed to have fields and needed to have types to them. And it's really made Drupal so much better. Um, so, but one thing I don't like in Drupal 8 is they, they kind of changed the, the terminology a little bit. So now instead of just having entities, we have content entities, and then we have something else called config entities. That's, that's a naming that just makes everything really confusing because now we're saying, okay, well, content types are a type of content entity, and so are all of these things that are not content. And then we have these other types of entities that nobody thinks of as being entities, so. That's just a mess. But usually when people say entity, in Drupal 8 it means content entity. Um, but let's just call it entity so that we're not forever confused. And I'll show you what's so great about these entities. So has anybody used Drupal console before? OK, so it's a, it's a command line tool. The author of it is actually here. He's named Jesus. You might have seen his talk last uh, period, it's a, it's a command line tool that can sort of auto-generate code for you. And one of the things it does really well is it can generate entity types for you. So you don't have much reason to say that you cannot have your own entity types, and that's why your carousel slide has to be a content type. You can make your own entity type. So let me show you what I, what I mean by that. Okay, so this is a, a site where they, I kind of, let me go to the home page. I convinced them on this idea that what they really needed was a notification system, okay? Because this, is, this organization, they administer the LSAT test to get into law school. And they have times when they need a notice on their site. <laughs> Previous to it being in Drupal, their notice was actually typically like, our site is going to have scheduled downtime for three hours. And I had to try to keep explaining that that was not going to be a thing they're going to be having notices about anymore. But they have notices like, oh, we had a change in um, when this when a certain test uh, location or something like that, or, or a snow emergency is, is done, this or that, right? So instead of creating a content type called notification, and then they would go and under content and add notification, I didn't do that because that would make the notifications show up in the search results and have all of these things I had to work around, right? So I made a new entity type called notification. So now if they want to add a notification, they go to notifications. Here's the list of their, they have, and this is the, the dev site where they haven't actually added notifications, but I can add a new notification. This is like the internal name, which, you know, look, I have a message. Name this notification for internal use, okay? Kind of helpful there. Then I can use like the same taxonomy that is used in the rest of the site, including the search results. Um, to say if I want to only show it in certain sections that are relevant, and I can make it active or, or unactive. And these are all just like normal Drupal fields because the entities, you don't have to be a content type to use all of the Drupal fields. And I can save it. Okay, and then if I look at the slide, I have a notification, right? So it wasn't hard to build that. I spelled notification wrong. Um, 
because I just I just you know generated this new content type and then I added some fields to it, and then I decided where to place it on the site. And now I don't have it like sitting in, you know, the in with the, all the other content having to deal with like the ramifications of that. Fine, it's a new entity type. Mm -hmm. It's a content type. Sorry. <laughs> Just check. New entity type. Um, another great thing about entities, now that we're in Drupal 8, entities have so many of the features um, consistently with contributed modules, they work with they work with views, which is now a core. They work with all kinds of tools. So any entity you use will have all kinds of powerful features. So here's an example of a site I've been working on this past week. And I'm using core media module, which provides an entity type called media. So here on this content type, you can add a video, and you can add a transcript file. This is like a, a TV um, organization, and they have episodes of their programs they put on the site. So if I want this, this interface here for adding related entities is called inline entity form. It's a contributed module, but you can use it to relate any entity to another one. It's a really nice interface. So if I want to, I, I can add a new video here. Okay. And I can put in, I'm going to put in, this will be confusing, which I like. Um, the, I'm going to put in the video of me giving this talk seven years ago so I can help myself out. Okay. And I can, you just put in a URL of the video. Hit create video, it creates this referenced content. So let me save this here. And there we go. Now I have my video. Now it's set. Drupal starts. And now I can use default one. Kind of sit back and thumbnail and preview or something break while I give the talk from the And they're kind of a pain because I take all the good names. You see? So, so what I like to do with image stuff is Is this still that of the seven um, years ago? Yeah. <laughs> see, I had, I had, um, I still had, slash. wait, yes. wait, I still had Drew Clippy first solution. Mm -hmm. I just had so different, my different. colors weren't as good. Well, this is weird when I'm doing stuff. This does seem weird. Okay, so. I'm going to go back to and show you some more things here. Let me remove that. Okay, so just to remember what we talked about at the beginning, or I talked about at the beginning, consistency. See the consistency? Add new video, capital video. Add new file, capital file. Right? Add existing, right? There's consistency here that makes things easy to use. And I have all throughout the site the same types of consistency. Another great thing that entities provide you with, watch this, add existing video. This is entity browser module, another contributed module. Any type of entity I can load up in a view like this and then I can reuse them in different places. I can add an existing file here. Here's my file. Right? So it's pretty nice. And then I can even edit it here. And this will, I could put in like a new version of the file. And it'll update all across the whole site. And anywhere the file was referenced, they'll have the new version. So that is pretty good. All right, so let me get back here. Can you <coughs> specify whether or not an entity shows up in search results or do does only content show up in the search results? I normally or? make only content show up in the search results, but you can. But that's configurable. That is configurable in search API. You can have multiple entity types show up there now. Um, that's cool. Okay, so view mode. Every type of an entity can have multiple view modes in Drupal. So 
when the sort of simple way to think about a view mode is you have typically the page where you see content, where you see the full version, and then a lot of times you have a teaser mode where like if you have a listing of content, you see a smaller version. But you can extend how you use these view modes. So a lot of times I'll have like one that's called a card view mode, and it'll be like a little card version. Um, and so if you, if you use these view modes and you name them well, you can, you can build things much more quickly and more consistently. So then when you go into views, instead of adding a whole bunch of fields all the time, you just pick to display a certain view mode, and you can configure your views really quickly, and everything's all consistent across the site of how things display when they're in different sizes and view modes. That can be handy if you've got multiple content types, different fields, mm -hmm. and so in views, okay, you have to add all the fields really to cover all the things. Just pick the view mode and content type. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so a role in Drupal, or a role is basically a set of permissions that can be applied to an individual user. Sometimes you'll you'll see people try to use roles in other ways as sort of just like categories of users, but they all have the same permissions, that just is going to end up making you have a really complicated list of that permission grid when you don't need to do that. You can categorize the users in a simpler way. Um, but the, you know, the real generic definition of a role is the function played by a particular, by a person in a situation. So that's what you should think about when you're naming your roles, right? So editor is a good role because the function that they're playing is they're editing the site. Um, but you know, sometimes you see roles that have all kinds of strange names. Another problem you'll see is that sometimes, sometimes you'll see sites where they actually have more roles than they have people using the site. <laughs> and each of them has like a different combination of roles. In general, in any type of complicated system, the less you use of something, the less problems you have. So I was thinking I could make this talk be like that Marie Kondo from that like tidying up thing. Like, spark joy. Yes, like if the role doesn't spark joy, get rid of it. But the thing is, in, in Drupal, it's hard to get rid of things. It's a lot easier to add things than to get rid of them. Adding a role, takes like two seconds. You go like add role and you have it. Have you ever tried to get rid of a role? You, to get rid of a role, you have to talk to everybody at the organization and how they're using the roles. Look at all the users and all of the permissions, make some backups, write some scripts. Getting rid of a role does not take five seconds. Getting rid of a role takes like weeks, right? Which is exactly why you should take more than five seconds when you add it, right? Like think about if you really need it, because it's not going to, things don't go away as easily. Things get kind of like embedded into the system and they're hard to remove. Okay, a couple uh, final terms to think about. Path in Drupal is really like a URL alias, right? But we call it a path, which is kind of interesting. Because like a path is sort of a road of how you get somewhere, but that's not really what we're talking about at all. I think in WordPress, what are they called? Like stubs or does anyone know what the the, the little set part of the URL is called? They have a different word that people use sometimes in Drupal that editors will use. Anyway, because path is just like a confusing <coughs> name, so is alias. Breadcrumb is also a kind of confusing concept. I think breadcrumbs are really important. And by the way, I put them on the same slide here because your paths and your breadcrumbs should be in harmony. Uh, a breadcrumb is basically like a human readable version of your path, right? So if your path is about staff Jody Hamilton, then your breadcrumb should be home about staff possibly also Jody Hamilton as like a clickable, right? This should be the same. So you need to make sure you're configuring the 
your sort of information architecture so that that all makes sense. But a breadcrumb is a strange name because, well, first of all, it reminds you of like Hansel and Gretel, and that none of that like you know went well with their use of breadcrumbs. It was sort of like they left the breadcrumbs, but wasn't the idea that that didn't work out? Like that was a terrible way to find their way back home because like birds ate them. So I think that's what they're referring to here. So it's like it's almost like they're making fun of us because it's like you're never gonna find your way back. I don't know, but. It also doesn't make sense because it's like, the is not necessarily how you got there, right? It's not, we don't, on web pages don't keep track really of how you got there. Um, they're sort of state independent, you know, unless you're in like .NET and then everything's screwed up and you can't hit the back button. Um, but yeah, so breadcrumbs are important, not great names. Okay. Uh, last one that I added was a paragraph type. A uh, paragraph type, let me, let me show you what that is. I'm pretty into these. It's a type of uh, bundle of an entity. Let's show you an example. So, so that's Drupal 8 specific, right? Oh, uh, no, I think it exists in Drupal 7. It's just become really popular um, in Drupal 8. So in this site where I'm editing this news page, and I had showed you the news page with this, with these different things on the list here, and then this newsroom, tis the giving season, media contact. Actually, let me show you a different page that's even more complicated. Kind of shows the power of it. So here's the home page. Again, I make the home page a piece of content, so they can edit the home page just like they edit any other page. There's not like 20 different ways that, like a lot of times, I find that, that it's really typical that people build a Drupal site, like they get the designs, and then they try to build the site so that it looks like the designs, and they don't really worry about whether it makes any sense when people edit it, which is a pretty low bar, because you're a CMS developer. So, um, so a lot of times you see home pages where it's like, in order to update the home page, you have to go to 20 different places to feature this and update this view and, do, and it doesn't, it's crazy. So I make it all on the same page. So to look at what's on this home page, we have um, a, a carousel. Then we have like this video. Um, we have these three, this is a view mode called card. Right, so it's like three pieces of featured content in card view mode. This is a call to action. I think my ad blocker actually got rid of this ad. This is a, something I learned on this project. If you call something in your system, uh, like ad, like name of a field or something like that, then you'll end up with, because I called it house ad, then you'll end up with markup that says house ad in it, and then your ad blocker will pull it out. So now I don't call anything house ad anymore, because that's kind of annoying. Um, this is another like component here where they can put in tabbed content. And here's a newsletter sign up with an image and some text here. And then some featured social items from different places. Right? So every single part of this page is configurable, including the use of these like visual elements and like colors. So when they go to edit, this is paragraphs. So here you see five different paragraphs. And you can add more. So each one of this, each one of these is built with like a, there's like designs for each one of these components. So these are the different options that they have. They can add another carousel, they can add an image slider, et cetera. And then when you open one of them up, inside carousel, you can you can configure these carousel slides, right? If you open up the email sign up, you can configure the description, the title, and the confirmation message, and the image. Um, you can also have some style options as well. This one is called a section, and it is blue and the title is social and then inside of it are three columns 
And each column is here. And here's the embedded Facebook post, and the Instagram, and another Facebook. So everything is on the page. Um, it's a lot, I think it's a lot better than some of the other content editing tools that we've worked with in the past. So your edit form gets complicated, but it's all in one place. It's comp so yes, it's complicated, but it, but in a way that makes sense. Like it's organ, like the order of everything is the same as what's on the page, mm -hmm. um, and you can kind of you're able to if since you know that everything is configurable and you know it's in the right order, you can drill down and you can find it. Um, so yeah, it is complex, but in like a way that you're able to find it. You're less complex than hunting around different yes. sections of the yeah. um, admin to to get done what you have to get done. Yeah. Um, Okay. If, you, yeah. if you have a home page, then you have a teaser, so we use paragraphs too. But if you have a, a, a page of, you know, a note or page, but you want to tease it in your home page, so it's like you still have to build or create something on the You still have to use a paragraph on the home page for that teaser. Yes, there's a lot of different ways you can do it, depending on if it's like a piece of featured content, or if you're just putting the latest content for the teaser. Um, so, and it can be nice to use the like inline entity form. Where's the page um, yeah, So as a paragraph, could you add a node? Um, and maybe it uses a specific view mode or something, but some way, so that way, person doesn't have to go to a separate page to edit that little piece of content. Yes. They see it in line on your page. Mm -hmm. So let me see. Like a, a but you don't need a view. Like mm -hmm. So yeah, let me show you. I think I have some here. Where did I have? Uh, somewhere in here I had these <laughs> is, your, is your edit form too, too complicated? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is... So this is like a content reference in here. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I handled it here was I just gave them a link that they, if, they, if they don't have the article yet, they can add it first, because most of the time they would already have it. But another way you can handle this is with this inline entity reference, where you can say, wait, clear this out again, where you can say, add new article, add existing article. And that way they can do either, and even when they add an existing one, they would be able to edit it after they add them. So it kind of keeps them all in there. Now is that available in seven or is that just for Yeah, in like editing form, yeah, in Drupal 7 as well. It's really useful, it's just a it's a it's a widget option for any type of entity reference form. And there's a bunch of like configuration options for it, you kind of have to mess around with a little bit. Okay, so don't have too much time left, but let me get to the third part. Okay, so kind of hopefully gave you a lot of food for thought, but but the sort of like next thing to think about is if you're kind of thinking of like, okay, well I want either I want to make sites that are better. Uh, with my team and put more thought into this stuff to make things nice. Um, or you might be thinking, but my site, I already have a site and it's all screwed up. So like, what am I going to do now? So a few different options. So first of all, when the way that I, the way that I kind of get to this with these projects and make sure that everything is consistent and well named is by specifically putting in time for that in the project and making an architecture plan of how everything's going to be named and how everything's going to be configured so that everything is consistent and, and well done across the site. If you skip that step and you just take designs the designer gave you and then throw it at your development team and then they all have different tickets to build different things, well guess what, it's all going to be a little bit different 
Everyone's going to have, every single part is going to be a little different from the other part. Nothing's really going to be consistent across the whole site. It's not, you can't just like take designs that are visual designs and give it to a developer to build the site as if the visual designs explain everything. They explain nothing about what the editors are going to be doing, right? And so a lot of like the, the art of being a Drupal developer is filling in that gap that people don't even always realize exists. There's an enormous gap between a design that's a visual design and the actual working CMS. And if you kind of gloss over that, it's never going to be great, right? So to show you like the process that I'm doing these days for these architecture plans, I call this one a build plan. I used to do it more like in spreadsheets, but I really like it to be, I really like this like more text format because it allows you to be more flexible in what you're writing. I hate when long conversations get boxed into spreadsheets and then people put comments in there and there's when they they add a column that's like that's like comments and then they add another column that's like responses and then they add another, it's crazy right so so in here for this project i took the designs i had conversations with the stakeholders i did all kinds of planning with the team and then i and then i make the the architecture plan or the build plan of how everything should get built. So for every content type, I have uh, how it's built and, and things linked to other pages. So this section is using the two column layout. Here's the, what, how the two column layout works, some notes on that, right? Um, so I have all of my content types, how, what the form should be like, um, how the different view modes should work, right? So this one has a card view mode, and here's like examples of it and explanations of what every part of it is. Here's, there's like a hero view mode for this one, right? Um, so those are like all of my content types. Then I have my all my vocabularies, my taxonomy, how those are gonna work, what everyone needs to know about those. And this gives like one, and, and this is editable by the whole team. So if anything changes, um, you know, you can update, these are always changing. So, so it becomes like one source of information, still like digging through a hundred JIRA tickets of like how did things evolve over time. Like this is like the book of like how, what things are called, how they should be named, right? Um, so here are our paragraph types for the project. So you can, so if you're trying to like build a page, you can be like, okay, well here's my options, right? I can add an accordion, I can add the two column layout, right? Here are my blocks that need to get made. Here are different layouts that are used. This part's about um, how the WYSIWYG should be configured. And here's like the media section, how all of the um, image fields should work. And the files, the videos. This is like your blueprint, mm -hmm. but you would still use something like Jira for the project track. Yes, but a lot of times the Jira tickets will link back to this, and they'll say. Oh, like, they can link. Well, the Jira tickets will oh, just goodness. say like, okay, you know, build the event content type, follow the build guide in this page. Okay, or and this is a web <laughs> document, so. Yeah. Why did you use to build it? This. Uh, this is a Git book. Git book, yeah. Um, which is okay. I, I like this better. I like the book format um, better than like one huge like Google Doc document because it just gets so big. Um, it's hard to find things. And I try to like I just didn't completely succeed, but I try to like kind of keep things alphabetical so you can find them faster. There's search, right? Um, so I have specific pages like how to build specific pages that we have designs for. I have web forms, I have what the user roles, content modera moderation, what modules I want used, third party services. And then this bottom part is the migration plan because um, it's migrating from previous sites. So this is like telling the developers how to do everything. So I can work on this for a week or so and then I can basically <laughs> walk away and the site's gonna come out exactly how I want it to be consistent. 
So that that really helps a lot. Um, another thing that I do a lot of is site audits. So, so if there's an existing site, um, I'll do a site audit on it, and a lot of the issues, I'll, I'll, I'll tend to look at everything. I'll look at performance, security, maintainability, um, cross-browser issues, mobile problems, all, all sorts of like, all sorts of things. But one of the major things I tend to look at a lot is the editor usability and the content model. And then, based on what I find there, um, we can kind of make a plan to improve the site. Right, so an example of of how I'm doing that, here's I kind of tried to anonymize one that I did recently. So I kind of go through everything, then I make like a summary of the recommendations with the um, how important it is, what the effort level is. So one of the main things I often find with the sites that I audit, editor usability tends to be terrible, which it's kind of why I give talks like this. Visitor experience problems, performance problems, maintainability problems, integration issues, etc. And then I kind of go through everything for each content type. I go in, I create a content, I fill in all the fields, I see what happens, I find all of the issues, everything that's confusing, everything that the fields that don't do anything, that are just sitting there, right? Go through all that, um, go into all, I go, I basically click on every single page in the admin <coughs> to see how everything is configured. And then I do it as every role on the site as well, see so what they can see. I test the WYSIWYG configuration, like every, really, really common thing in Drupal half the buttons in the WYSIWYG don't do anything, like because they haven't configured the, the um, HTML, like what's getting filtered out to match the buttons. So when you try like the buttons, you end up with, like things are styled in the WYSIWYG, but then when you look at them, they're not. That's always the case, pretty much. Um, then you go through the media system, the user roles are usually a mess. Um, I get into the cross-browser testing, information architecture, um, get my breadcrumbs, the related content, and, you know, it goes on and on, site search issues, performance, there's, on this particular audit, they were using a module called Flag that has a, a bug in it in Drupal 8 that makes every single user have a session on the site, which means that none of them are getting varnish caching or using the CDN that they have on their hosting. So like the average load time was nine seconds. It was just from like this one bug. Um, so yeah, that's a site audit for you. And then the other thing that you can do like in terms of the t a team is, is just to kind of enforce the, the importance of this kind of stuff. So, like, in, so we always do code review, but we include, we do like review, even for things that aren't really code, things that are site building. And the nice thing now in Drupal 8 with the, with the config management system is it's still code that you can review. It can still have like a pull request for any type of configuration change. Um, and then we can review that in terms of like, wait, like, that field needs some help text, or or that the way you name that isn't very good. We're not going to merge that until that's fixed, right? So just to make sure that the whole team is in agreement that these things matter, and that you have like a system to review, so that people know it works. A lot of times, like I don't have to tell my team to do it right because they know that I'm going to review it and send it back if it's not right. So they kind of like know to do it right because they're not going to get away with it. Um, that's it. So, thank you. And anybody have any final questions? Sorry, I talked about.
uh, you have projects with cust like you have customers who will actually pay for this kind of auditing and, and like thoughtful review and everything? Um, yeah, good question. Um, similar <laughs> questions. Yeah. Time do you spend on documents? Yes. Okay, that's a good question. Um, okay, so I guess so. The question for the leg, in case you didn't pick up, you know, do I actually have um, clients that? that see the importance of this stuff and like want to pay for this type of work to be done. Not necessarily always, but I kind of, I guess I kind of cheat a little bit because like my superpower is I write these reports and do these audits super fast. So they probably like wouldn't like want to pay for it if it weren't f for the fact that like I can do it fairly inexpensively. Like that last one that was like 30 pages, I did that last week in like two and a half days. So it's not really like costing them like twenty thousand dollars, right? So they're not, they're good. But the thing, the reason I can do it, and it's worth doing, a lot of times it leads to a ton of work that's going to be like development hours. So it's almost like a, a sales thing to kind of like do these audits. Um, in terms of the the build plans, that's not something that they're asking for. But it's going to make the development process faster. So if the project is big enough, it'll actually end up saving us money on the, on the other side. How much time does that typically take? Not that there's any typical site, but... To make like the build plan? The build plan, the, ar the architecture plan. Um, it's, well, it's usually like in terms of work time, I would say like 30 hours. Ish, but in terms of like time, time maybe three weeks or so because you have to like have some meetings and some discussions and get some feedback and thirty hours is just your time. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So. So it has to be. all the interaction would be probably double that. Yeah. yeah. So it it has to be like a fairly large project. I mean, these are like. As I say, as a percent of the project. Yeah, these are like one hundred thousand up. Projects, right? If it's a smaller project, you obviously want to scale down uh, the planning, but hopefully it's a less complex project too. Uh, if it's a super complex project and it has no budget, you know, it's going to be tough, whatever you do. So, no magic solution. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you.